Are you ready? Everything's recording, yeah. Hey, that's great. Hello, my name's Neil Storey. Thanks for having me along tonight. Paul and I go back many, many years, many. about 20 odd years at least. And he said, would you come and give a talk to the battlefield guides? Well, I don't profess to know the fields of this remarkable part of Europe very well. Although the story of the 1st Battalion, the Norfolk Regiment, I've known for most of my life. What I'd like to share with you tonight is really the story of ordinary men, but not in World War II. And I hope that, I'm not going to try and teach you to suck eggs, but I hope that some of the stories that I'll share tonight will give you some different perspectives on the men that made up what became known generally as the Powell's Battalions, and particularly Kitchener's Army. So if you've got questions as we're going along, feel free to ask. And as I say, I don't want to talk down to you. I want to share the story, and I hope you'll, you'll find it quite interesting. The most, most of you have got an interest in World War I, yeah? And some of you have done an awful lot more than just have an interest, I oh, know. All the pictures you'll see tonight, the photographs, and some of the documents are from my own archive. I've got about 20,000 original images that I've collected over the years. So unless you've got some of my books, you might not have seen some of the images before. Others, as you and I all know, there's only limited numbers of those particular themes and images to share. So, best I get started, really. The First World War, the world had never seen anything quite like it. Wars had always been fought on a foreign field. They were very distant. The world had never seen troops come home in great numbers, injured, sick, wounded, the impact of war. But also, We'd never seen a mobilisation of a huge citizen's army. So when war broke out in August 1914, for Great Britain anyway, there was very much a feeling that war's going to be over by Christmas. You've heard that saying, haven't you? And there were very few people up top that re would really countenance that we would need anything more than a British expeditionary force to send the enemy packing. So when they appointed Lord Kitchener, Kitchener Cartier, a national war hero, he'd earned his name in Victoria's Small Wars as Secretary of State for War, then he was going to tell them something different. And he put them straight. He said, this war is not going to be over by Christmas. It's going to take three or four years to, to win it, if we're going to, or if we're going to stand a chance of winning it. And it's going to take an awful lot more men. And in fact, he said, I'm going to start with 500,000 men, just for a start. And we shall go for a volunteer army. Kitchener and people like Lord Roberts had never really liked the territorial force. They mistrusted that. You, you, you know that the British Army was divided up. You had territorials, regulars, and you had militias and reserves. He didn't like any notion of the territory, these part-time soldiers. No, no, we want volunteers, and I'm going to train them. And the, it wouldn't fit into the regular army structure. Kitchener had also burnt a lot of his boats with some of the high-ups in the regular army. He didn't make friends very easily. During Queen Victoria's The Little Wars that won the empire, sometimes he'd be there and he, and he would give his vision of how this battle should take place or how this attack should take place. And if he was overruled by a more senior officer, he'd say, very well, sir, and respectfully go for it. And when it all got messed up and went really wrong, he'd make it well known that he'd told that officer what he should have done and rub his nose right in it quite publicly. So it doesn't earn Kitchener a lot of friends. But for the British public, this medal-wearing, big moustache-wearing, guy was a national hero. He was on biscuit tins. He was up there with people like Lord Roberts and Kitchener. You'd have it on one side or the other of your kitchen tin. So they trusted him. They believed in him. And as these youngsters were growing up, they'd grown up in an ethos of, of patriotism. And we'll look a bit more at that in a minute. So these wonderful pictures that we see of these lads from all over Great Britain answering the call for Kitchener's army. Remembering, this is before PALs were properly introduced. The PAL scheme came in with Lord Derby up in, uh, later on. These are the original Kitchener's Army men. The men, just ordinary guys off the street. And don't forget, 
This is an all-volunteer army at this stage. Conscription for Great Britain was only brought in in January 1916. So people often say, oh, they had no choice. Well, they did. They did have a choice. But they volunteered and off they went to war. When they saw that we'd had this dreadful carnage, the Battle of Mons, Battle of the Marne, you'd more or less in numbers seen the original 70,000 annihilated. And yes, you've got all the reinforcements going in, so it's not a decimated battlefield, but you've got around about 70,000 gone already. So by the time we get to 1915, you've got coming on stream quite rapidly an all-volunteer army of ordinary men, what they used to call citizen soldiers. And that shouldn't be forgotten. So why did these guys go? Well, as I mentioned, it, it all began at school. It, children were raised in a patriotic ethos, the belief in king and country or queen and country. Remember, these kids, if they went to war in 1914, they've got to be 18, 19 years old. So that really means that they would have seen in their 18 years of life, Queen Victoria, they would have seen her, her last jubilee, maybe. They would have seen the coronation of Edward VII. They would have seen Durbars out in India. And then after the death of Edward VII, you would have seen more coronation, more Durbar for King George V. So these kids were really exposed to not only patriotism, but the real zenith stuff. Great big occasions, learning to march. After the death of Queen Victoria, Every year there was an Empire Day. So these kids, they'd be taught the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But they would also be taught patriotism. They'd start their day, they would salute the flag. If they did some physical training, it would often be called drill. And it would be a type of military drill. So from a really early age, these kids are taught militaristic movements, uh, a degree of fitness. They are taught in their learning that you do what's on the board. You do what you are told and you will do well. You will support your king or your queen by doing what you're told. Be, go be good British subjects. I know nowadays you have to say it's citizens, but you were British subjects. And that was for boys and girls. They all had that patriotic ethos. And you're going to think, what are these girls doing saluting with their left hands? Well, that's because they're girls. Girls salute with the left hands on Empire Day when they march past, and boys salute with the right. So who were they when they were growing up? They've learnt their three R's. Some of the kids would have progressed to grammar schools. Some of them may have got scholarships to go, and go further and go to universities. And when Richard Burden Haldane reformed the British Army and he created the Territorial Force and the Regulars, the first thing he did was he created the OTC, the Officer Training Corps, that created a seedbed of future officers in grammar schools and public schools. And that was 19, 1906, 1907, you start seeing a real major development of the OTCs in the junior and senior leagues right across Great Britain. So when you start thinking about it, it starts to fall into place, doesn't it? That we really were quite a militaristic country. Not heel clicking like the Prussians, but they all could have become quite eligible to be soldiers. And that was the point. And then as they grow up, what are you gonna do? There's no television. There's occasional films, there's slideshows. Even think groups like the Young Men's Christian Associations were very much into football, getting teams together, playing amateur football. These are the Leeds Salem Amateur Football Club, 1910 to 11. And the Leeds Salem boys, they actually, you can imagine, when war broke out in 1914, the majority of them went along and they were some of the founders of the Leeds Pals. You've got already teams forming together that share those same sort of views, share those same sort of values. Could even be that they all shared uh, a particular chapel, or they went to a particular church, or even a different, in a cricket club. This is the Acr Accrington Cricket Club. It's a super pitch, love their moustaches. There we are, 1906. And again, 
It's cricket clubs, it's football clubs that went to form these groups of lads getting together, all joining up together. And of course, to fill their time, you've got to do things that are both patriotic and active. So nothing better than Boy Scouts. It's going to keep you active, it's going to be patriotic. There is a sort of joining procedure to it with ritual, with saluting, serving God, serving the empire. And of course, if you look at this and you think about it, what are Scouts told? taught to do. They're taught to live off their own wits in the wild, they're taught to march to the drum, and they're learnt to regulate their day through bugle calls. So if these guys grow up and they join the army, they're off to a really good start, aren't they? And not only was there Boy Scouts, you've got things like the Church Lads Brigade and the Boys Brigade that are not only learning how to march to a drum, le learn that their day from flag up, reveille, to last post at night. It's all regulated by bugles. But you'll also notice, can you see amongst these guys here and on the ground, can you also see what the church, remember this is the church lads brigade, what are they being taught to do? Yeah. Shoot and drill with rifles. And they were very, very proud of it. So these are Christian organisations that are teaching kids to, to fight as soldiers, to drill and turn out as soldiers. And that, sometimes if you see it out and about in auctions and postcard fairs, it, oh, military camp at Walkworth. And yeah, there's no difference between that and a territorial force camp. But it's not a territorial force camp, nor is it a regular camp. That's the Boys' Brigade camp. This is up in Walkworth in Northumberland. See, they're, they're sleeping 12 to a tent, head to the pole, and it's laid out exactly the same as a territorial force camp. These kids would have seen them, you know, at weekends with the Saturday night soldiers of the territorials going away for a weekend camp. Just the same, summer camp. So as these kids are growing up, they're in responsible Christian organisations, they're in the Scouts, they're playing sport together, and they're exposed to scarlet tuniced soldiers on the street. The army nowadays is often quite distant from, from towns and villages, but of a weekend, when you've got your local platoon mustered for there, they'd often go to the local church on church parade. So you'd get to see people that you know, Maybe your dad, maybe it was an uncle, a friend of the family, a neighbour. People, caught, don't they look smart in their uniforms? You know, the girls go for a soldier. So, although there was still the old stigma of the soldier was a bit of a drunkard, you've heard the Rudyard Kipling, Tommy this, Tommy that. But there was something about it, something about that army at that time. And I think this, we've had a wet day for some of us, we've been out, looking around at Parvi and sort of all today, it's <laughs> soaking wet. But you do it if you care and you're interested. You know it. And you just look at the British public here on this soaking wet military Sunday. What's that, 1906 in York. It's sheeting down with rain, but the boys are on parade and thousands have come to watch. That was, the, that was how different it was back in the day. So when the time came and you got to be about 13, 14 years old, then it's quite possible you could become a drummer, not just in your local territorial force. If you really wanted to go for it, you could, if you were lucky and you were good enough, you could join the regulars as well. You could go on, you know, it could be a full-time regular soldier. But a lot of lads, 13 or 14, they went with their dads and uncles and brothers. These are nice, lovely example, Northumberland Fusiliers on their camp. Go and be a band boy. And as some of you may know, these lads that were very, very young, some of them were quite tall, strapping lads. And when the, t when the time came, you know, they were quite keen to go and they weren't above passing, you know, altering their ages a little bit so that they could go with their comrades. And you'll know full well that there were lads 14, 15 years old. Yes, some got detected and were sent back, but there were lads, 14 or 15, in many battalions. Once you start digging and you find them, 
they're out there. And not to mention, if you can, once you are properly old enough, or you, you're in, you're accepted. This is great. 5th Battalion, North Lanks. And they're off at their camp. And that's great. They're having a beer, they're having fun. And don't, you know, these guys, they're, they're labourers, they're working guys. They could only dream of having a paid summer holiday. So this is the nearest thing they could have to that. You could have a week, 10 days, two weeks for some regiments, and you can go away and, and get paid for it. Yes, you've got to do your manoeuvres, but you're away from work for the summer. Well fed, got to maybe do a route march or two, but it was great. For a lot of territorial units, it's interesting to note that before and even during the early years of the First World War, they had to wear their own boots. The territorial associations did not have mass, mass stockpiles of boots to issue these lads when they were mobilised. So this picture, yes, it's taken before the war. This is 1910. But you can see guys on camp, I don't know how well you can see it, they're wearing clogs. Can you see them down there? I tell you no lies. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's absolutely true. And if you look really closely on these guys on mobilisation, a lot of them, they've got brogue tipped shoes and, or boots, you know, that they've been mobilised with in 1914. But that's the North Lanks. And you'd, you'd see the same for a lot of our Northern lads. Let's go to the next picture. So that's your background. 1914 was a beautiful summer. 1914, it was a beautiful summer. And by the time we get to that summertime, it, it really felt that it wasn't a matter of if, but when war was going to break out. The whole of Europe had been a touch paper for years. The Navy race between Britain and Germany had certainly got a lot of backs up. If you want to, you probably learned an awful lot about the causes and the road to World War I. What's not often mentioned is the literature that backed this journey up. When you look just after the dawn of the 20th century, you've got things like The Riddle of the Sands by a man called Erskine Childers. And that's one of those stories where two young lads have foiled a plot with an enemy that's plotting against Great Britain. And then you start seeing the literature develops. William Lequeux claimed to be a had worked with Belgian intelligence and he had secret knowledge that he built into his novels and stories, which were mostly about spies in Great Britain that are gonna rise up and destroy all the infrastructure so that Germany can easily invade. It was pretty dirty stuff. And by the time we get to 1910, you start seeing authors like John Buchan, most famous for the 39 Steps, uh, which, you know, the Richard Hannay story. Uh, that was published in 1915, but Buchan was writing propaganda pieces before then. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. They're all, this sort of genre of the invasion danger is well known to the British people. So when we start seeing these rumblings in Europe, yeah, there, there's going to be something happen soon. We also had concerns of our own out in Ireland at that time. And, you know, when you look in the media, it's either Europe's looking a bit dodgy, but so is the question about British rule and home rule out in Ireland. So there's all sorts of, there's two factions. It could have gone either way. This is lovely. This is the Royal Field Artillery Camp, Bellingham, Northumberland. And you'll see these lads had a great time. And ordinary people thought this could be the last time we can go out and have a good time before this outbreak of war. They worried about shortages coming in really quickly. Some of you will probably know Whitley Bay with the shuggy Spanish boats. City. There it is. And the Spanish city was still there. Well, you put more clothes on than over the beach. Yeah, you did. <laughs> put more things, more layers on. You had to have a, you had to have a bathing <laughs> machine to get changed to get in the water. But this... It, innocent age of pieros and seaside entertainments, I think make it all the more sad when you think about that these guys, they're not going to war in complete innocence. 
But you have to remember, in 1914, the world had never seen a war like the First World War. So when I explain this to school kids, I say, right, in my pocket, I've got free tickets to Euro Disney. Who wants to go? Oh, yeah, we want to go. And that's how a lot of these guys felt. It was going to be a big adventure. A lot of these ordinary guys that had just gone into volunteer, they still thought, yeah, it's going to be over by Christmas or soon after. So by the time I get my uniform on, I get trained, get done, get out there, it's going to be all over by the shouting. That was the whole idea. That's why we look back and we think, God, it's so tragic when we see these young lads laughing, smiling, waving their hats and off they go. But they were happy to go. They really were. It, and every soldier, the veterans that I interviewed over the years, the soundtrack, every, everything I've listened to, Imperial War Museum, everything I've read, they have all said that they felt like they were going on the greatest adventure of their lives. And they didn't want to miss out. And that was the core of Kitchener's army. That was the core of why these guys went. First guys to be mobilized for war were the territorials, actually. They were put on coastal defense duties, like these guys. Northumberland was, it was a real wet worry that it was going to be a target for invasion or attack. Because you've got to think the Clyde is this huge shipbuilding area in Scotland. Well, the biggest shipbuilding area in Great Britain is the Tyne. And you've got to defend the Tyne. Because if you, if you can sail one of our battleships out of the Tyne, then sure as eggs is eggs, the Germans could send a battleship down the Tyne and attack along that route. So you had, really, their, their job would have been simply to observe and maintain a certain amount of order and calm, showing that the British Army is responding to this need. So they were territorials. Often they had been designated as special or emergency companies that were identified for use for this immediate mobilisation. Some of them were called directly from their summer camps to these positions. So just with the territorials, yes. would a reasonable number of them have been ex-regulars? Ex or would they mainly be just clustered reservists? The, the, the ex-regulars <laughs> tended to be reservists. And they what they would do is that they would sign on to what they called the, the, the special reserve and the army reserve. And, you know, because you only had to be on for three years. And some old boys say, I'll sign on for another three. So they tended to be what they used to call the old militia battalions, the third battalions. There were ex-soldiers, of course, in territorials, but in the main, they were citizen soldiers. They were part-timers. <coughs> and this is the first territorial army unit to really be given a serious task of war. And they're actually the Tyne Electrical Engineers. And their job was to shine searchlights from the mouth of the Tyne across the North Sea in case the battleships came in. And this gentleman here, that's Fiona's granddad. Right, cool. Which one? Handsome, this one here. Obviously. Here we are. That's Matthew K. Matthew K. One of the first to be mobilised. So when they did mobilise them, I don't know whether... You, you, there's not many of these survive, but... This is the Territorial Army embodiment notice that had to go out, you know. They'd had an, an inkling, and in fact they'd been... The first warning order went out at 7.30 on the evening of the 4th of August, 1914. War was properly declared at 11 o'clock at night. So at 11 o'clock at night, they'd had several hours to get all these stamped up with times to report. So the idea was, you report the following day, the 5th of August, and some of them, like this guy, he's got to report as early as six o'clock in the morning to the headquarters of his local territorial unit. So they're quite a rare survival. But they, they were embodiment notices and they were same all over the country. And talking of the Spanish city, that's where, <laughs> that's where they were based. Because remember, ter <laughs> ter territorial soldiers don't have barracks. Regular soldiers, they're in barracks, so you've suddenly got thousands of men needing places to be based. Also, you're not going to need to base them in land because of all these fears of invasion, not just in Northumberland, but all along, particularly the East Coast. 
you've got the territorials mobilised, where are we going to put them? Well, schools are out, so they went into school buildings, and got a big building like that. Yep, yeah, sorry, we're going, to, we're going to take over the Spanish city as military quarters. And I just love the fact that when you look along the coast, a lot of these places, they were already producing their own postcards, so it was only a quick, oh, blimey, just change the strap line on the bottom there, and within days, they were having these, and they were selling them off to the soldiers' base there. Isn't that fantastic? Not there anymore. This is, this beautiful building is now restored. Yeah, but the rest of the Spanish city Oh, gone. very sadly gone. But... The Spanish city. Where, where is it? it was named after the Spanish battery <coughs> that was nearby. And the reasons for why that was exactly called that, there's a variety of reasons. One of them is that they, they used Spanish labour to build it back in the late 18th century. But there's, there's other stories that... You know, <laughs> you know how names get attached to certain places. Absolutely. Come here, really. Nick and R. Nick and R. <laughs> so, what else are we going to do with these lads? Well, the initial fears of this coastal invasion... They did linger on. In, in some parts, they flared up on occasion, and right through until 1918. Because right through until 1918, German battleships were parking themselves off the British coastline and shelling us. So in, in 1914, the first shelling took place off Great Yarmouth and Galston. The second one was off Hartlepool, Whitby and Scarborough. That was in December 1914 and on a number of other occasions subsequent to that. So there were those alerts, but they thought, no, we could use the territorials a little better, some on the coast, get some inland, get them trained up for active service. Maybe think about deploying abroad as well. You know, some of these lads were getting ready to go out to France. So here we see members of the Northumberland Fusiliers. Where are we going to put those? I know, loads of tents. We can fit those on, on the race course at Gosforth. So that's what they did there. Problem was that when they created the territorial force, the idea was that the regular army that was on home service, regular army would tend to have two battalions. One battalion in every regiment would always be abroad garrisoning the empire. The other battalion would always be at home on home service. Very rare that you'd find a big battalion of, say, Northumberland Fusiliers, Norfolk Regiment, Suffolk Regiment, every county had its regiment. It'd be very rare that you'd find a regular battalion in the home county. They'd have a depot there, but these guys, they'd be in bigger army bases like Aldershot and Worley, Purbright, um, Catterick, big bases, and also over in, in Ireland as well. Hollywood Barracks was a big one near Belfast. So... War breaks out, the British Expeditionary Force, 70,000 men deployed to France. Away you go. Territorial force mobilised, defend the coast, great. But everybody knew that they were going to need more men to fight this war abroad. So they had to say to the territorials, we know that when you joined up, it was just to defend Great Britain, but it looks like we're going to need you abroad. And you had to sign a piece of paper as a territorial called the Imperial Service Commitment that said, yeah, I'm happy to serve abroad. And so that's what they did. 90% within between September and October 1914 signed it. So if you've got a family photo or somebody shows you a photo of this little tiny badge on this guy here, you can just see that one on the right hand side, medals, usually this side, something up there. I'll give you a close up of the badge. You see one of them. The Imperial Service Badge means that he signed the piece of paper to say, yes, I volunteer to serve abroad freely. And they, they were quite something. They were phased out really by 1915. Some lingered a while. What, what if any, stigma would be attached to anybody who didn't sign? If you were one of the 10% who didn't sign, would you, would you, would that accept you just go to stay at home service? Or are you, are you kind of... What, what would happen was... That was September to October. After that time, there was quite a bit of pressure put on you. Okay. Particularly if you were young enough and you were fit enough. If the guy really did object, and particularly if he's got a family and that, yeah. that kind of commitment, 
they would be put into training one of the reserve battalions. Or if he wasn't a very good soldier, put him into something like a Cooks or whatever in the reserve battalions. But once you get to 1916, there's no question about it. You go. So that's why they, after, after the end of 1915, there's no point wearing that. They didn't wear them anymore. Would you, just, sorry, just, mm. Anybody who perhaps didn't sign up then, do you know any cases of people who perhaps later in the war realised perhaps they should have mm. done and perhaps would... Oh, they, they all had to go. They all had so to go. You, get, you either get conscripted or you... <laughs> Yeah, you could go into the reserve battalion, but in 1916, when you've all got to go, anyway, you've yeah. got to go. If you're a if you're a one fit, you've got to go anyway. So within two years, it just changed. It was all in. Like yeah, said. absolutely right. And if you think about it, it's January 1916. You've had the Chantilly Conference, which is all all the heads. You've got Joff, and you've got um, you've got Haig, and other senior commanders that are really thrashing out. What are we going to do in 16? They knew that they had to have something to break that deadlock on the Western Front. So that's why they brought in that conscription. Not necessarily, hopefully to get extra men in, but also to replace those that you might lose when you took part in such a huge action. And just as an aside, as you'll probably know, the First World War, was when we entered the war, there was still a great belief in cavalry and yeomanry. A lot of the yeomanry did become da dismounted and they were deployed as infantry. But early on, 1914-15, the yeomanry were mobilised. And this one I love. Northumberland Hussars Yeomanry want a limited number of recruits who must be good horsemen. Applicants may present themselves for the usual tests at uh, Gosforth Park at 10 a.m. any morning except su what's it at Sundays. So don't, dis don't disrupt the church parade. <laughs> so they were certainly ready, and they were one of the few yeomanry units that was actually deployed uh, with the British Expeditionary Force. And if you look at some of those famous photographs of the Christmas truce, they actually show members of Northumberland Hussars. So this man. Horatio Herbert, Lord Kitchener, Secretary of State for War, August 1914. He wants his men. In many ways, he had the, this great sway in the War Cabinet. The War Cabinet were not going to argue with him. They knew that things had to be done. He said he wanted half a million men. And in essence, they said, well, if you can raise it, you can have it. And so they started off initially with just a paper poster that went out there. You start seeing the pointing finger ideas from around about September 1914. This is Sunday Market. This is Newcastle, but you'll see it certainly is. And, you're, and it's, it's the sort of place that the recruiting areas would draw in, they'd bark it up. Because girls were patriotic too, it was the pressure was on. Girls would be saying, hey, why don't you join up? Why don't you be, you know, and they put up these posters. Why is your best boy not in khaki? If he doesn't love his country enough to serve it, does he love you? So it was certainly that the pressure was on. So you'd go. And particularly if you're in one of these football teams that's got lads aged between 16 to, to their early 20s, then if you're the 16-year-old lad, you're big enough, you're going to want to go, aren't you? You're not going to want to miss the trip to Euro Disney World War I. So you'd go along. And one of the very familiar things in a recruiting office would be a young lad would come in, he's tall, he's fit, he's past all the fitness, and the sergeant major would say to him, right, my lad, where were you born? Who are your parents? How old are you? And he'd say, I'm 16. I didn't hear you right, boy. Go out, come back in, and tell me different. So he'd go out, what's going on? There'd be a couple of soldiers who are prime. What's he said to you? Well, he sent me out when I told him his age. Well, what'd you tell him? Well, I told him I was 16. Tell him you're 19. Then you'll be all right then. Really? That's a lie. Just tell him. Go back in. Right, lad. How old are you? 19. Active service. You're in. And it was that simple. If he could pass the height and the look, Sometimes the parents complained, sometimes an official check was made of the forms and things didn't tally up. So these guys would get a, a rap on the knuckles. It'd be a pretty serious rap too. But in the main, the check was 
Yeah, but not always. What do you mean? They would, they would check the parents. They, they would check through the forms. They, maybe there had been something suggested, something said. They would, they would reread it, look at it again, depending on how thorough the adjutant was. And remember that every soldier that the sergeant major passed, he'd get a, an incentive bonus, as did the medical officers. So don't forget that. <laughs> so the posters like this went up all over the country. This sort of message from Lord Kitchener, it sounds like a ticking off after playtime. Be honest with yourself. Be certain that your so-called reason is not a selfish excuse. Enlist today. The pressure was on. But I have to say, in a lot of areas of the country, particularly when you get to the September, August was a bit of a struggle. And the reason for that in a lot of areas that men were still earning an okay amount of money. In the summertime, as a labourer, you could go and help with the harvest. That was your biggest earning time of the year. So the government soon clicked on that a lot of these guys were looking at, right, army pay, it's a shilling a day. I can get seven, eight, ten times that one day work on harvest. So you're going to get a bit of money behind you, which is why when you look at a lot of the recruiting posters, the local ones that would go up, if it's an agricultural area, it's the second burst of September 1914. But to be honest, you really didn't need a lot of pressure up here, up, up in the north of England. You know, Yorkshire up to Northumberland, they didn't need a lot of pressure. The lads, they'd been so coached in this patriotism. So, and do you know what? When you work together so much, you've grown up together, do you know what? If we're really honest, and really honest, you, you can just throw away patriotism in some ways. Because do you know why a lot of these lads joined up? Because they wanted to go with their mates. That's what it was. They knew about the flags and stuff. That's, that's fair enough. That's taken as red. But, and you, you ask any man, you know, we wanted the adventure. We wanted to go with our mates. That's why I really, really wanted to go now. So I'd go with my mates. They also felt, yeah, I'd feel cheap if I didn't go with my mates. You know, I'd feel let, I'd, I'd feel let down. I'd feel like I missed out. So there's a whole lot of this medicine. So this poster here, if you look on a lot of pictures of Northern England, it's not a big high pressure, we need you. It's this come along boys. And particularly in railway stations, you'll always see that one, you know, facing the lads when they got off the trains. Come along boys, that was the big one for the North. As was this one, a little bit more urgency there. Once we start getting into the September period, more men still needed. Another call. You'll see that was very popular. And if you think about it, trams ran all around town. So why not, like the Leeds here, the Leeds pals created their own recruiting tram with an illuminated sign that said, God save the king. <coughs> and it's great. It's in a Kitchener's army. Go now. We need 500,000 men. Come and join our happy throng. So that was whizzing around the town. It was quite a big thing. And then... Postcard artists that have been creating seaside cartoons. Kitchener wants more, I like that. She's pushing them out as fast as she can. <laughs> Love it. Where's that? That is the top of Northumberland Street. <laughs> you got it, absolutely. Gray's Monument. It is, it's Gray's Monument. And do you remember that one? The shop on the side there. It's not Fenix, is it? Isaac Walton's. No, I'm not I thought you'd like to hear that bit though. Yeah. And the point is, yeah, you've got a lot of working lads in there, but you've also got guys that are working in shops. You've got this, not just the front of house staff, but guys working in the storerooms, in the warehouses. You've got insurance workers. So, but on top of the, the, the people from what they used to call Upstreet in the north, you've got huge factories. You've got mega factories that are weaving. They, they, there's, there's cotton, there's wool. There's quality silks. You've got shipbuilding. You think how many men it took to build a ship. Now this is a super picture. This is the Queen Mary leaving Jarrah. There it is, in 1913, when everybody used to line the tine and give them a wave as they went out. Now the lad we 
we used to get the day off school when a new ship was being launched on the Really? Island. Yeah, we, when I was in primary school, we still got the day off to go down when Swan Hunters launched the ship. Yeah. It was the only shipyard left, and then Thatcher sort of that, of course. Yeah. So we don't even have that now, but... Yes, but, I still remember getting the day off to go and watch major ships be launched. And that would inspire you. You'd feel, bloody hell, I want to be part of that. You know, I'm building yeah, those. Fancy being a riveter, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but this gives you an idea. This is chucking out time at Swan Hunters. That's the kind of stuff that you're dealing with going out. Can you imagine the sound when these guys have got hobnail boots going up cobbles? It must have been incredible. And then not on top of that, you've got mines. Now, I'm not... The point is, you know... If you work in a shipyard in those days, you think of the health and safety regulations you had back then. You worked down a mine over 100 years ago. The health and safety regulations, there's some, but nothing like in the modern world. So if you think about it, the chance to go and serve your king and country, well, you, you've got it. It's safer and you're guaranteed food and your family get a little dividend and your mates think, well, well this is great stuff. Unless it's stuck in a tunnel battalion. When did miners become protected in World War One, or did they never become a reserved occupation? What happened was, with that initial recruitment, nobody expected Kitchener's army to take off quite as it did. And you've got places like Ashington, mm -hmm. Bedlington, where you've got 200 lads joining the same time. They actually went Tyneside Scottish, which is why Bedlington still has the Tyneside Scottish colour in, in the church. From here in World War <laughs> Absolutely, II. that's right. We shall have a look. Well, I'm, a, I'm, an ordin I'm an honorary Geordie Jock. No, you're not. I bloody am. <laughs> I bloody am. I have the time, everything. I did, I did a lot with those boys over the song. I'm very proud I am to wear it too. But the point is, they went. And they, and they, they didn't have any regulation to hold them back. So with all these guys going, all of a sudden, they think we've got to hold on to what we've got left. But then what they also did was they brought back some of the older boys and recruited in really young lads, aged 14, 15, 16, and trained them up and got them down the pit. For me, this rends my heart to see these, these northern lads. And they didn't have very much. Some of them, they didn't even have a spare shirt. So local people used to get together and they'd give them the three or four pairs of spare socks and a spare shirt and they went to war with their effects, not in a kit bag, in a brown paper wrapping. And that's how they went to war. And I, and I just think the innocence that they had, their friends would lead, lead, lend them a decent, one decent collar because a lot of the lads used to put a necker in over there and you, you, it'd be white, it'd be clean, but a decent collar and a tie so they could march away to war. And of course, it, people had big families. And, I, and you look at this guy, this guy used to run the waterworks in Newcastle. And he's got five sons all marching away to war. And, and some people, they didn't think of the danger. They didn't think of what could happen. So, and you wanted to go with your mates, with your brothers, with your friends. So if you go into action and it is a bad day, the impact that that can have, not just on a city, but a particular area of a city, a town or a village can be absolutely profound. So the, with the initial join-up, all the lads had to go to a place called Frenham Barracks up in Northumberland, and they found that the uniforms were already running out, so you start looking a bit motley. Because some of them, all they've got is a, wo a woolly hat. Some have got no hat, no cap badge. Southern has gone out with good uniforms. <laughs> And they got their food brought out to them in tin baths. And then they found that there wasn't even enough eating utensils to go around. So you'll see some of these guys are eating out of a pie dish. Or they got it with a hand. Also, I mean, this, this phenomenon you'll see all over the country, but in the north of England, you've got these huge industrial areas where you've not just got universities like Manchester University, you've got technical schools, which also had their cadet corps, which made these, you know, really eligible recruits. You want those boys in. Manchester University, it's almost forgotten now. They had the universities and public schools. It was a brigade, four battalions. And Manchester University supplied one battalion. 
out of that brigade. A thousand men. Call to arms. This lovely old hand. This is a handbill. You get posters. Town Hall, Sheffield. They knew how good the universities were. So once you start getting out of that initial burst, they're thinking we can get specialist sort of groups in, like getting a group of university lads. But the problem was with having university battalions was that these were the guys that had been to OTC. They had a bit of experience, so all of them could be eligible to be officers. So if you have a battalion of all these really highly qualified guys, it could be seen as rather wasteful. So out of the brigade, three battalions were taken more or less to become officers. The one battalion that was left, that was the Manchester lads. And they were more or less, not completely annihilated, but decimated. They were dreadful. But these were intelligent, clever lads. Every single one of them offers some material. And they go into the Battle of High Wood on the 20th of July, 1916. A totally waste, wasteful attack. And you know, it, from your battlefield knowledge, any wood, if there's activity going on there, both sides are gonna get, are gonna shell it. And it was, it was dreadful. Another reason why we lost a lot of ordinary good guys that could have been officers at the joining up stage was because the uniform was so very, very expensive. So that yes, you could have ordinary guys that showed that aptitude, showed the skill, and if they'd got the scholarship to go to a, a grammar school or to a public school, they were well educated. But this kind of price range that you see, 75 shillings, well an ordinary man, a young, young man at work, 15, 20 shillings a week. Do you get the idea? So if you've got to try and buy a jacket and that's 75 shillings, plus all of your kit. As an officer, your kit was not issued to you. You had to buy it. So it meant we lost, in those early stages, a lot of really promising and good men. Once they started to learn that lesson by 1916, they started providing an amount of money so that a young officer could buy his uniform. Heartbreakingly, I've got invoices from tailors sent to the next of kin of these young lads that bought them on tick, and of course they'd been killed before the bill had been paid. That's how terrible that loss was. And in the land of the time, we had uh, a commercial battalion. By the time we get to September 1916, the British Army is, it, it, sorry, no, September 1914, Kitchener's army is costing a bomb. In, the, in, 19, in August, you've got 100,000 men. In September, with all these lads coming off the farm, you've got another 100,000. Uniform supplies are getting really thin. So they started this scheme whereby they asked, are you willing to pay for a unit? So some phenomenally rich people could say, yes, I will create a sportsman's battalion of the Royal Fusiliers. Other places like Chamber of Trades and the Newcastle and Gateshead Chamber of Trade said, yeah, we'll, we'll raise, initially they raised B Company of the 9th Battalion of the Northumberland Fusiliers. That worked really well. And they said, right, we're going to go for a battalion now. They had to pay for everything through their training until the War Office was able to get more funds and kind of adopt that battalion. So it was a costly business. They did get their money back but they raised another two battalions on top of that. So you ended up with the 16th, and you had the 18th and the 19th. It was fantastic. What happened to the 17th, you're gonna say? Well, the Northeastern Railway raised a battalion of the Northumberland Fusiliers too. But with all this uniforms running really short, what are you gonna do? Well, they started giving guys little tickets like this one to say, right, you've enlisted, with the date on it, and that you could carry it in your pocket. So if you've got a bit of grief, you could say, no, I've enlisted, here's my card. And so they started marching. No uniforms, no boots, that was a big problem. You men wearing the work boots, they soon got worn out when you've got to do a 20 mile route march. And then not only did you have chamber trade units, you had units that, that capitalized on communities such as the Irish, or the Scottish, and you can see things like there was the Liverpool Scottish. Well, 
Indeed we are. They, they were a remarkable phenomena, and the Tyneside Scottish created their brigade. When you've got to raise a battalion in Kitchener's army, you've got to raise 1,200 men. Now, an average battalion has 1,000 in it, but during training, by finding some men too old, too young, unfit or unsuitable for frontline work, then you'd lose roughly 200. So by, if you see what I mean, if you've raised that many, so you need to have a good solid thousand to deploy. And we had the Tyneside Scottish Brigade. Now, a lot of Geordies thought that they would join the Tyneside Scots because they'd get to wear a kilt. They'd enjoy the crack of that. But the war officer said, no, no, not having kilts for the Tyneside Scottish. You can wear a hat. You can wear a Glengarry and make do with that. So being, that would have been better, mate. Yeah, well, well, <laughs> do you know, now, did you know that helmets were not issued to the British Army until 1916? Well, is that the northern half of the British Army or the southern <laughs> That's the half? whole half of the British, the whole British Army. You recognise where this is? Casey's Court, mate, I tell you, Casey's Court. So they got round it by saying, our band will have plaid. And this is lovely, this is the black and white Northumbrian plaid of the 1st Battalion Tyneside Scottish. And I love that because it really hacks off the Scots because that is an older tartan than just about any other tartan registered in Scotland, the Northumbrian tartan. But you can imagine these guys, they went over on the first day of the Somme. And when the Germans saw them, they didn't fire at them because they thought we'd sent over the lunatics first. Which, if, if you've ever met a combat piper, they weren't far wrong. But not only did you have four battalions Tyneside Scottish, you had four battalions Tyneside Irish. And again, they're not solid all Irish. It's got a core of Irish. But again, it's, it's Geordie lads joining with their mates, their manners, and away they go away to war. Tyneside Irish. Mm -hmm. When they joined up, they didn't even have a card, so what did they do? They got green cloth, and you can see them there, wearing the green cloth. They're wearing the green, boys, wearing the green. <laughs> and of course, to really build it up, there was publicity for these, you know, remember those bombardments I told you about? Hartlepool, Whitby, Scarborough. So how far, just, how far I like to see were these Dirty, great big German. About a mile. About a mile off the yeah. shore, they were just shelling the crap out of you. Yeah. Of the East Harley, Coast. Harley, 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 Harley. Yeah. Well, the monkey hangers. The monkey hangers. Monkey hangers. <laughs> yeah. But they were about a mile off. So they, were, they knew the position of the towns. Often it would be a very misty morning. Yeah. And local people would often say that they couldn't see the boats, they just saw the shells coming over. You look, you're talking 14, 16 inch diameter shells. Oh, yeah. They're just throwing them in yeah. and then just go. Yeah leaving a minefield behind them. So when we sent out submarines in pursuit, the subs would crack, would crack them. Don't forget as well. I oh, know. And when we think about it, September 1914, it's when so soldiers start coming back en masse to Great Britain. So that's another way of generating recruitment, just by <laughs> these guys being visible, being moved from stations to hospitals and the auxiliary war hospitals. You might not know about those, but they were in civilian houses yeah. all around the country. Like Places yeah. like rectories, you know. Anyway, do you know who this is? That is Lord Derby. And he is the man, that he's behind the Derby scheme. But before the Derby scheme really kicked off, he created the idea of Powell's Battalions formally as a publicised idea. You've got to remember, August and into September, Kitchener's army didn't have this, it, they weren't selling the Powell's idea, it was just happening. But what Lord Derby did was he said, well, if we guarantee if you join together, you serve together, then you'll get the Powell's coming in. And so that was that big sea change. So the first Powell's battalion by name were actually Liverpool, the Liverpool Powell's. <coughs> A lot of these other lads, the Northumberland Fusiliers, Northumberland Fusiliers, it was the second largest regiment in the British Army. So, and it had the first Kitchener Battalion. But they didn't really have pals by name. So the Liverpool pals, the Accrington pals as well, the Yorkshire lads, they really worked with that idea. This is lovely. Derby, funnily enough, was one of the patrons of the, the Rugby League. 
Yes. And all the PALS regiments come from the M62 kind of corridor, which is rugby league territory. You've got it. And they played, it's back to where we started with all those teams, it's lads going together. And Lord Derby, if you look at the Liverpool PALS cap badge, which is this kind of eagle and child, that's his family crest. There's a pub in Chorley called that. Yeah. And, and he, that cap badge, it, it was produced in solid silver and given to every member of the Liverpool Pals. So if you get a, a real pucker one, it has a 1914 hallmark on the back of it. It's really worth having. Is it a pub in Oxford? Yeah, Eagle, Eagle and Charlie. It's very famous. I just used to get drunk in the one in Chorley. It's, a very ancient, it's an ancient story and an ancient symbol as well. It predates the Great War. Chorley FM. Chorley FM. Coming in your ears. Ooh, no. uh, hey, uh, mm, now look, yes. remember these lads haven't got uniforms, so they, they end up, they're, to, they're, they're told to come for your training in your work clothes. Well you've got a lot of these guys, they work in banks, so they come in really stiff collars and they're really smart suits to start training. So once you get a little bit of basic training, you're getting the boys, as they marched around the cities and towns where they were raised, You'd always get men tagging on the back, more joining. And it came to a point where, you know, you've got to get these guys out. Get them away from the area so we can raise the next battalion. And also, once you get boys away, it means that they're not going home, you know, of a night time to go and uh, have a bit of time off. You know, you, once you get them away to different camps around the country, they start gelling as soldiers. And that was the point. Get the soldiers away into camp. So it could be, I mean, a few miles would be a big thing years ago. There we are, thinking of you at Cramlington. Or even taking the Geordie lads down to Bovington. And that was a big Northumberland fuse. And lots of other units went down there too. So get them away. This is down at Holton Park. And again, it's, it's, this is the 14th Battalion, Northumberland Fusiliers. There's not a uniform amongst them but they start getting the rifles. Old Boer War long Lee rifles, but you're starting to train with weaponry. Most of the, most of the men, um, if, what they did was, once they started kicking off Kitchener's army, they took a lot of the men who had been NCOs in the territorial force, and they took them away and made them NCOs in Kitchener's army. But even they ran out. So you're just looking for savvy men. So, yeah, at this stage, it was very, very variable. And when, and when you got out there, often, I mean, from 1915, that was quite a rapid deployment to the front lines that you were kind of getting, you are put into a reserve trench. When you, you, you get out there, you put in a reserve, you observe, and then the next thing you know, next week, you're in the front line. But a lot, a lot, the, the, the old rank structures were often... You'd have the guys that had been the officers in the um, YMCA groups, in the, in the church, right, lads brigade. So they had a certain experience as being officers in those units or senior NCOs. So it wasn't cripplingly bad. We were not s sending totally ignorant men to war, but you couldn't train them for battle at this stage. Once they started uh, thinking, right, once these boys get to France, you can't put them straight into a reserve and then put them into the front line, which is when they started establishing trench training camps, places like Bull, the, the, uh, the Bull Ring, and at Eat Up, Eat Up, Eat Apples, the old boys used to call it. it you know, but they used to have the, 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 the instructors there had these yellow armbands, because they all used to say they were bloody yellow bastards, you know, they, and they were bastards. They, and that's why we had a bit of a mutiny issue there, which was very unusual of the British Army, but they were absolute, swines so if you're going in you you got to have a sense, sense of humor and you'll see these pictures for all sorts of regiments these boys are west riding regiment and you're just having a laugh these are my beloved Tyneside lads and they are wearing something known as the kitchener blue now with no uniforms what you're gonna do you got to get these guys looking like they're in some sort of military unit so they contacted criminal lunatic asylums prisons, the post office, the railway, anywhere that might have similar spare uniforms. They dyed them blue and they made these hats, like a chip bag hat, the side hat you'd know from World War II. 
and they got laughed at. They said, what are you, Belgian refugees? Are you convicts? What are you? So in those days, there was... <laughs> so that all British Army units got these kits in the blue. So they used to call this, call them Fred Carnot's Army. Fred Carnot was the top comedian of the, the years before the First World War. So they used to sing the song, and I've cleaned it up because there's ladies present. We are Fred Carnot's army, the red ragtime infantry. We cannot fight, we cannot shoot, what bloody use are we? But when we get to Berlin, the Kaiser, he will say, Hock, hock, mine got what a bloomin' fine lot Fred Carno sent today. Or something like that, anyway. So the lads had to make the best of it they could. I like the way the Bradford pals decided, right, we've got a mixed match of uniforms, we've got a batch of tram conductors' hats, and we're going to try and look a little bit smarter. So well done, boys. Looking good. And a lot of them, they got the shiny buttons on, right? They're tram company buttons that they were putting on there as well. Or, or plain white, white, white metal ones. But eventually the uniforms came through, but they're coming through piecemeal. We'd had a real problem, not only with a shortage of supply, but making the uniforms because khaki dye, well, the greatest manufacturers of khaki dye before World War I were the Germans. And they weren't too keen on supplying us after the outbreak of war. So you'd get it piecemeal, you'd have to mix and match with your mates, but eventually you start to look like soldiers. Here we are, King's Liverpool Regiment, lads. They're looking good. But they were citizen soldiers. And once you get in your uniform, you start feeling like it. The training gets stepped up a gear. I love this picture by Donald McGill. There are some fine openings in Kitchener's army. <coughs> and as you can tell, these are northern chaps, including this instructor, that even in snow wear vests. Just for the phone. But these guys, you know, they're, they're down, they're, they're working hard getting in and out of the trenches, learning what they can before they go. And they're certainly learning how to go in with the point. Durham Light Infantry lads, they're showing that even the webbing ran out, so we had to have this leather stuff called the 1914 pattern webbing. So this is front and side view. It's made from leather with some elements in, in, in the canvas webbing. And you'll see that once they start, they trained in it, it was only ever meant for training. You can get 50 rounds in each pouch, rather than, that, rather than the 150 in the 1908 pattern webbing. But these guys were quite proud of that. The leather webbing certainly became a symbol of Kitchener's army. So again, if you're trying to re look at, research your family history, got people, give, give them some advice. If it's got the leather webbing on, the chances are he's going to be Kitchener's army. Some territorial units had it, but I don't think you'd really see regulars wearing the leather stuff. Sometimes they'd just keep, the keep the belt, or they'd go for a spare. Yeah. Have a spare yes. one. The S belt. Yeah. So once you've got all your kit and you're starting to do the long marches, yeah, your feet certainly start feeling like a ton. And I love this. If the Tyneside Irish have gone by, then I can come out. <laughs> but it was all about keeping your spirits up, keeping the morale up there. And a little detail to look for, not just on northern regiments, but regiment. not every regiment had them badged like this, but a lot did the Pioneer Battalions. Now, you were talking about the mining lads that help out with the tunnelling companies going underneath the Western Front. That certainly happened. And if you went out of the line and you're on what they used to call the rest camp, well, that would mean that you'd be regularly given parades. You'd also be sent, even if you were just an ordinary re regular infantry unit, you know, or a Kitchener's unit, you are put up there to help the miners going underneath the ground or help the Pioneer Companies. So rest wasn't much of a rest, and in fact, a lot of men used to say, yeah, I'm glad to be leaving rest behind, I'll go to the front line for a rest. You see what I mean? So look on the collars, and if you can see a pick and a rifle, collar badges, they're men of a pioneer battalion. So that's well, and don't forget, 
in a battle, the pioneers, they're running the supplies up all the time, all right? So they're running ammunition, wire, sandbags, reinforcing poles, duck boards. You get the whole idea in battle. So they're making the journey back and forth, back and forth. They often get forgotten. And then if you manage to hold the forward line or have to retreat, once that line is stabilized again, yes, your, your troops, that's where the, you, you, your forward facing battalions, that's where they are. But if you're in a pioneer battalion, oh no, 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 you're not there to, to hold that line. Your job now, boys, no fight on. There's a road needs repairing back there. There's a tunnel that needs to dig in there, or there's reinforcement for the trench required around there. So it was a hell of a war. And if they were putting it into action, running, and there was a counter-attack, they could even be drafted in to help with the fighting. So don't forget the pioneers. And the story of the Labour Corps as well. You know, quite a lot of history, oh, just Labour Corps. God's sake, these guys are not always, miles, they're not miles and miles behind the lines. They're really not. And that was, a, I think that was a pretty thin end of the wedge. So eventually, yep, they get down to Wiltshire. A lot of these lads mustered on Salisbury Plain before they deployed to the Western Front. And this gives you an idea of what they would have looked like leaving from one of the Wiltshire stations near Salisbury Plain. These are the 18th Battalion Northumberland Fusiliers. They were one of the, uh, they were the, one of the, um, uh, commercial battalions that had been raised. They were pioneers. And they packed up their troubles in their old kit bags and smiled, smiled, smiled. Off they went to war. Some of them leaving very large families behind. That's a hell of a job for the mum to cope with all that lot. Mind you, some of the lads certainly thought, I'm going to go to war for a bit of peace and quiet. If we're really <laughs> honest about that, you know. Slightly sexist. <laughs> But that was the thing, but that's the postcard of the time. We've got to remember all of these things, that was the way things would think then. So this lady here, she's Durham Light Infantry, her husband. And when you see pictures we're like- We're an equal opportunity employer at the DLI. There we are. But don't forget when you see pictures like this, there's a reason why dad isn't on it. He's away at war. And that's why they're not all beaming because the, the, the photographer knows this is the message. We're thinking of you, Dad. We love you. We miss you. My great granddaddy Liam was DLI. So I think those pictures have a lot of meaning to them. They really do. And also, how on earth do you get word back how you're getting on? <coughs> so the field service postcard for the guys that are at the front, you get one of these a week. If you're lucky, you maybe get two or three a week. But this is the text message of 100 years ago that you had to cross out how you're getting on. Once you got back to uh, the rest camps, you could write a longer letter. But when you write on the front, this tended to be it. You, if you wrote a longer letter, you might get a privilege envelope where you could send personal messages. Can I just ask? Yeah. Because there's this whole myth around World War One that when troops went to the front line, they were there forever till no. they were killed or went off. Mm. Now, my understanding is it's kind of 14 days in, I'm and then re returned to behind the lines? I'm now coming on to it. <laughs> but I'll, ju I'll just do an introduction of this bit. You'll, you'll all probably recognise this. It's France. It's map, Neil. Down yes, here it is. <laughs> this is England, England, Dover, Calais, Boulogne. This is the Western Front. Hundreds of miles between the Belgian coastline and the neutral Swiss border. For us, in the British Army, we're holding the line between up here. This is where the sort of opening battles were fought, really, around on the Wipers salient. And that's really where the war ended, around the Wipers salient as well. Wipers is also known as Ypres. Ypres, you're familiar with that? All sorts of names, but Wipers is what the Tommies called it. Down to here, 70 miles down there to the Somme. But the early battles are up here. The Somme was meant to be this new front where we push through. If you were a soldier in the trench, it would normally be a week to 10 days. If you were asked by one of the brigade commanders, if another group had had very bad losses or there was a difficulty, they might ask you to do two in a row. But for the British Army, it's really a maximum of 14 days. Really. Occasionally you'll get a bit more, but the whole point was 
14 days front line maximum. The average is about a week. Then back into the rest camp that wasn't much of a rest and then back into the reserve line to observe and reinforce if there's an attack and then back to the front line. Hello. So for we'll just say week each? it's 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 about a week to 14 days maximum <laughs> in the front line. Well, we left the northerns longer. We've established that. obviously. <laughs> yeah, obviously yeah. So but by we, request so if one week in the front, one week west camp, one week Yeah. yeah. The yeah. It's, so it's a three it's in rotations. In the French army, of course, they left them in the front line until the division took such casualties it could not hold the line any more than it would be withdrawn, which is why you end up with mutinies in the French army. That's simply nothing to do with bad esprit de corps. It's everything to do with these guys getting hammered day in, day out, week in, week out. See, when like the, the French army, they stuck the Bretons in the front line, the same as in the British army, they stuck the Irish in the front line and left them there. They hung them out to dry because... The French class, the Bretons, is expendable, and the British always class, the Irish, has been expendable. They, they, you can find an element to that, but in the main, you, you never really did longer than 14 days. Normally, it would be a week. That was my impression, was it was two That's weeks max. The same yeah, the other side. absolute max. The, I, their, their rhythm also seemed to be very, very similar, because they didn't want familiarity. It's not just the Christmas truce of December 1914. There were regular truces because who, guess who, what? Who won the football game, by the way? It was only a kickabout. <laughs> it's like kids at break time in school. But the, Did it happen? Yes. Yes. I mean, there are written accounts of men who were actually there. And, for, and there were, those accounts exist in newspapers and parish magazines. If you start to dig for your particular area and county, if your regiment was there, they are there. They've just got to dig a bit more and find them. I know, I know for the Norfolk Regiment, I've got three brilliant accounts that hadn't been published for a long while. And they, you know, they were in the papers. But yes, that was your rotation. And even with just a week in the front line, you could get badly infested with lice. And you know the stories of the trenches, I'm sure. I don't need to elaborate too much. This picture kind of sums it all. You start off as a spuggy recruit, particularly as an officer being sold all the kit you didn't really want. You train, you cut the kit down to the kit and caboodle you really need. You become hale and hearty, your legs become strong. You're a good soldier, you're ready to go. Three weeks in the trenches, you look like a tramp. And there's many accounts, you know, the guys tried to shave, but often it wasn't very easy. The, the shortages of water. If you've enjoyed this, I'll come and, and, and you'd like to know, I'll give you a trench special when we come again. But what I wanted to just share is the story of ordinary men that became part of this remarkable Kitchener's army, the men of the North. There were men from all over the country that joined Kitchener's, but I know the North best. That's why I've used this story. And can you see the difference between these order, orderly pictures that you'll see of lads back at home? If you got out to France, they'd often have the photographer, his shop has been blown up or whatever, and he'd come out to near the front line and get his camera out in the nearest village and take photograph of you. They'd have a nice backdrop quite often, sometimes it's just a wall, but quite often it's the photographer's backdrop, but look on the floor and look for the cobbles or look for the mud and look for the mud still on the soldier's boots. That's the key. But yeah, through the winter of 1915 to 1916, the water sluiced down on the Western Front. It's bitterly cold. Sat in those trenches, you've got guys being killed by stupid things like drop shorts, snipers. They're, go they're going home because they've got exposure to cold, chest and lung complaints. Yeah, not, not combat. <coughs> really rubbish complaints that you get, these poor lads. And so... Not necessarily every morning, but regularly. Regularly. And if you complain, if you complained, you would be sent to the MO to have to have a look at you. You might have heard of something called trench fever. Now, trench fever is caused by lice. Now you think, oh yeah, lice, burn it out, itchy, just unpleasant. It's not. The damn thing can kill you. Because if you have enough lice bites and you're unclean, remember you haven't got the antibiotics to clear that up. So people like J.R.R. Tolkien, if you've enjoyed Lord of the Rings, right? You might like it, you might not, or The Hobbit, right? 
In the First World War, he was an officer. He got severe trench fever because of these lice bites. And it nearly killed him. If he'd died, there'd have been no Lord of the Rings. He hadn't written it by then. And it's not just him, but it's the whole story of lots of very talented men of all ranks. You think what we lost. So through that winter time in particular, men got really fed up. They produced trench newspapers. Famously, there's the Wipers Times, but lots of units had their own papers. And then when you get to 1916, and this is very short while, we've finished in about five minutes. This is where our boys, they got the tin helmets for the first time. So can you imagine that you've had the end of 1914 and all of 1915, no tin helmets. The kind of shrapnel that's raining down on these guys, dreadful. So once they get the helmets, they got to thinking there's something big coming off. And they, believe it or not, they wanted the song. They wanted something to break out of this deadlock. You imagine that you're not fighting. You're occasionally going in as a tr on a trench raid. You know, life is bloody horrible in that rotation. They want something that will break through. And they knew that some of them would get killed, but they wanted to break through to help bring this war to a bloody end. Can you, you can imagine that, can't you? That's, that's a little aside. This is, these are German trenches near Tiepval. And they were a gift to reconnaissance pilots because they were on the high ground where the chalk beds were. So we could actually see the German lines, because all in the spoil, it was filled with chalk. If you knock up the contrast, which they could do in developing, you could see the trench lines perfectly. And of course, they're in the higher ground, which meant they didn't get the mud problems that we had down the hill. The other thing we hadn't really taken on board was just how deep under the ground they were. Like that. So you can have a shell hit directly above them. But they're, so, they're 20 foot down in quite often. So when we sent over a, over a million shells the week before the first day of the Somme, British and French artillery, over a million shells, it was said, oh, nothing can live there. All the wire will be cut. Well, the wire wasn't cut, and certainly they had not annihilated the enemy. So the tragedy was that the night before, that everybody had been given strict orders, don't mention the attack, but one officer had sent good wishes for the attack in the morning to his lads, and it got intercepted by a listening post, so they knew we were coming. We also had another clue that the bombardment, for all those days, it, it stopped for a little while. Yeah. It was. It was. They, I mean, the men were quite confident. They really, and this is the tragedy of it. You know, we can learn so much and look back in hindsight. They didn't know. They, yeah, they knew it was going to be tough. They knew someone would get, but they didn't know. They thought, we're going to make this. We're going to do it. These are Lancashire Fusiliers. These are fixing bayonets. As an incident, can you see their fixing bayonets? Only one in 20 British soldiers even got close to using their bayonets during the, the, the Somme offensive because the majority of them were gunned before they even got near the enemy. And there were more British soldiers injured by British bayonets on the first day of the Somme than we got to injure Germans. Do you know why? Because if you're going up a trench ladder with your mate behind you, your bum goes straight onto the sword bayonet. These are, the these are the explosions, these are the underground mines, places like Loch Nagar, you know, every so many, every, you know, I think there were 15 of them in total that went, this is Hawthorne being blasted up, and that picture's taken from a mile away. If you look on YouTube, you can actually see the film of this huge, it looks like a great big oak tree erupting out of the ground. And the idea was that this would provide cover for the men, the ridges of the explosion, they could run around it and get some cover as they went across no man's land. Not a lot of good, really, and it certainly let the Germans know that we're on our way. 7.28 in the morning, these are detonated. 7.30 in the morning, once all of that has fallen down, over we go. Over went our Scotty Pipers. To me, it's tragic. These boys, have, they've not got a weapon. Can you seriously, seriously imagine going over the top, playing bloody bagpipes? That's it. You're walking towards enemy machine guns. And they open up and these guys are still playing. 
These guys, they get the knee shot out, they tumble down into craters, and they stay playing. And some of these guys survived. And they weren't just in the Tyneside Scottish, they were in their Tyneside Irish had pipers, the Liverpool Scottish had pipers, any of these various units that had Scottish elements to them went over. And then you'll know that other units, of course, they kick footballs over. It's true they existed. And these guys, if you think about it, yet the first wave, they can go over naively. You've got four waves of men quite often that go over. <coughs> and they're followed by another brigade after that. So they've seen what happened to their mates in front of them. Can you imagine the courage that that took to maintain that kind of order, right? That's the Tyneside Irish going into action on the first day of the Somme. It's not a put-up job. That's them going over that ridge. They've seen their mates killed. Tyneside Scots went over before. That's the whole brigade of Tyneside Scots went over. And they've got rifles slung on the shoulders. And they said they kept their order like they were on a field day. I think it must be even, I was talking about that not such a long time ago. It was even, I think it was even much more scarier the second time. The first time you were going, as I said, you thought after they did shell for months. And yes. So, of course, they must have been scared, surely, but they were also pretty confident. So, but if you did survive the first time, I mean, the second time, you knew what it... Yes, you saw it. So it must have been even uh, scarier the second time, if, yeah. you, if you understand the point. Well, if you imagine, you've gone over the first wave, the second... Imagine you're the third wave or the fourth wave going over. You've seen it. This comes from Martin Middlebrook's excellent book called The First Day of the Somme. And this shows you all of the battalions that took casualties of more than 500. <laughs> Now, if you think an active battalion that went over the top on the first day of the Somme normally consists of 800 men. So if you go over 400, that's half of them wiped out. If you go to 500, that's, that's pretty damn serious. And if you think about it, you know, you, you see these guys here. Every one of these that has got a red poppy, that time side Scottish. Every those with the green, that's the Tyneside Irish. So one of the forgotten pieces of history, yes, the West Yorks and the Newfoundland battalions, they took terrible, terrible casualties. But the Northumberland Fusiliers took more casualties than any other regiment because of the sheer numbers that were involved. Tyneside Scott Tyne, and Tyneside Irish were part of the Northumberland Fusiliers. It was a terrible, terrible day. And really, Kitchener's army never existed after the first day of the song. It couldn't. Local regiments couldn't have that same identity because you brought in conscription. And if you are conscripted, you are sent anywhere. So if you look on the casualty lists or army lists, you know, lists of battalions, they're lads from all over the country from 1916. The identity has gone, and we would never see their like again. Of the North, that's just one page of tens of pages of local lads. The harvest of the Somme. And to add an even greater sadness to a lot of Northern lads, Lancashire, Yorkshire, Northumberland, in a mining area, Miners tend to keep their identity tally in their boots so they don't lose it. So where do you keep your dog tags? Not round your necks, they put it in their boots. So when it came to identifying the bodies, the men that were going often were not the men of that battalion. So they didn't know where to look. So that's why thousands of these lads have no known grave. Or at least they have a grave, but it's regarded as a soldier known only to God. And their names appear amongst over 70,000 British and Commonwealth lads on the Teat Vale Memorial. So my friends... 300 unknown French, 300 unknown British. Yeah. It, and when you go to Teat Vale, and I hope you all will, when you go up the hill, that's where we attacked. This is where the German machine guns were. 
So when you look around the, the Tietval Spur and you see that incredible view all around it, that's the, that's the view the Germans had. Walk down past the cross, down the hill, that's where we were and we were attacking uphill. So my friends, thank you no, for listening. Yeah, thank, you. Absolutely thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Our boys. Our boys.